Good afternoon. My name is Ivory Clark and I am the director of the National Academy of Medicine's Culture of Health program. We'll give folks just another 30 seconds to jump on the line before we begin with the formal program. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the National Academy of Medicine Culture of Health Program, Advancing Health Equity, Science, Practice, and Outcomes Listening Workshop. Again, my name is Ivory Clark, and I'm the director of the program. My colleagues and I are delighted to have you join us and our speakers today, and over the course of the next two days, if you'll be joining us and for our afternoon sessions tomorrow and Thursday. We have an engaging number of panelists who will be sharing their knowledge and experiences with us as we work to advance health equity and build a culture of health. Before we begin, I would like to briefly cover some logistical items for the meeting. Next slide, please. Our meeting today is being hosted over Zoom and it is being recorded. The chat feature and Q&A function have both been enabled. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat feature to let Steven Shukura know Please use the Q&A function for questions only. The Q&A function will be open for the duration of the webinar. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the session. We'll have an audience Q&A at the end of the meeting. Please note that we will not check the chat for questions to the panelists. We will only check the audience Q&A function. Thank you. Next slide, please. In the virtual world we found ourselves in, we are doing our best to offer multiple ways to actively participate. We will utilize Poll Everywhere and the chat feature to offer a space for additional reflection and commentary. We hope that you will engage in lively and respectful conversations in the chat. When you registered for the meeting, we asked you to suggest principles for engaging in community conversations, and we are sharing some of those suggestions with you now. Please keep these in mind as you listen in during the meeting, as well as when engaging in conversations and in the poll everywhere. Our panelists will be holding themselves to these principles, and I invite you to consider them in the work that you do as well. Some are more applicable to a real world when we're back in person, I should say, uh, but all are appropriate for the conversations that you engage in on a day-to-day -day basis. Next slide, please. Before moving into an overview of the Culture of Health program and our meeting, I would like to provide a moment of pause to recognize the voices and efforts we stand upon and are building from as we work to advance health equity for all people in the United States, many of whom who have been and at times remain invisible. As a point of reflection, I invite you to go to the website native-land.ca slash and identify the traditional territory you are joining us from today. I am based in the Washington, D.C. area on the lands of the Piscataway people. The native land map does not recognize, represent, or intend to represent official or legal boundaries of any indigenous nations, and it recognizes that it's not perfect, but that it is a work in progress with contributions from the community. As we work via the program to elevate the diversity of evidence from engaging with communities, I encourage us each to acknowledge the richness of cultures and perspectives that are foundational in building a culture of health. Thank you, next slide. The Culture of Health program launched in June of 2015 as a collaborative partnership between the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the National Academy of Medicine to operationalize the vision for building a culture of health that is grounded in the evidence base, multi-sectoral in, in its collaboration, and engages the range of stakeholders necessary to have real and meaningful change happen. The mission of the Culture of Health program from at the, at the National Academy of Medicine 
is to identify strategies to create and sustain conditions that support equitable good health for everyone living in the United States. In the first phase of this multi-year collaborative effort, we centered our work on four primary goals. To lead through building a solid knowledge base that can inform actions and partnerships to advance health equity. To translate by bridging science to action for impact on health equity and optimal health for all. To engage by strengthening community capacity. And our fourth goal to sustain this work by transforming culture in the United States through sustaining progress that has been made and accelerating progress in areas that still show significant health disparities. I'd like to thank and acknowledge that we have an 18 member advisory committee that provides strategic guidance to ensure the program meets its intended goals. We've achieved a number of accomplishments using multiple modalities. And with the guidance of our advisory committee and their input, we've completed four consensus studies which reviewed the available evidence on advancing health equity across the local to federal spectrum and through the life course, undertaken traditional and novel activities that communicated the science to broad audiences, most notably through our art shows. We facilitated the development of community-driven health equity action plans to advance and demonstrate application of report recommendations, and we fostered cross-sector multidisciplinary conversations, collaboration, and action in support of report recommendations. These efforts were only the beginning of providing a reliable evidence base, building a network of stakeholders, and developing and disseminating the resources that are needed to further advance a culture of health. The program aims to create a shared understanding that health is more than disease, treatment, and what occurs within the clinical walls. A culture of health exists when people recognize that health is linked to access to care, as well as the environments in which we live, learn, work, play, worship and age. Our first report under the program, Communities in Action Pathways to Health Equity, identified nine social determinants of health, which include education, employment, housing, transportation, social environment, the physical environment, public safety, income and wealth, and health systems and services. The report acknowledges that personal responsibility is a factor and one's health, but we must also understand that the choices an individual makes are dependent on the opportunities that are available to them. And this leads us to an understanding of health equity, which means everyone has the opportunity to attain their full health potential and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or any other socially circumstances. Next slide. I'll share just a few lessons learned from the first five years of our work. And these lessons include that health equity is crucial because it is fundamental to living a good life and building a vibrant society. Enacting change requires a broad group of stakeholders, including scientists, policy professionals, healthcare services, educators, artists, and the like, to come together to innovate and strategize a way forward. And finally, particularly relevant to our conversation today is that empowering communities must be at the heart of our efforts and stakeholders should address the needs that communities want to fulfill, not what stakeholders believe communities should have. Over the last several months, the Culture of Health program has engaged with key stakeholder groups to form a deeper understanding of the priorities and perspectives in order to uncover common ground that will form bridges and collaboration necessary to advance health equity. These groups include researchers and practitioners, decision makers, and organizations that are accountable to and elevate the voices of communities. Next slide today, please. Today's meeting is part of a series of listening workshops in which we've heard from these three key stakeholder groups who have an impact on the policies and systems that can reduce health disparities. We've held these listening workshops to understand the most pressing questions for the field, where priorities are heading, and what challenges are being faced and are likely to come in the future so that the Culture of Health program can support these stakeholders. The meeting today, tomorrow, and on Thursday will explore the challenges, priority areas, and strategies for achieving the structural changes necessary for advancing health equity by engaging and elevating the voices of communities with a particular emphasis on those most impacted by inequities, including Black African-American, Indigenous, and Latino populations. 
In today's meeting, we will examine and understand the current landscape for community-driven efforts to advance health equity, especially in communities most affected by inequities, and centering the voice of the young people in these communities. We will identify and discuss the barriers and gaps experienced by communities and organizations supporting communities working to advance health equity. We will examine promising models of community-driven efforts to change or enact policy that advances health equity, as well as identify strategies to address the root causes of inequity that can inform the work of other communities. And finally, we will identify the priorities for community-driven efforts to advance health equity and opportunities to use community knowledge, strength, and resiliency to inform the way forward, especially in a world affected by COVID-19 and increased calls for racial equity. Next slide, please. I would like to acknowledge the hard work of our planning committee for this meeting. Stuart Butler from the Brookings Institution, Monique Brown from the Healthy Neighborhoods Project, Petra Harmon Onehawk from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, Logan Herring from Reach Riverside, Tracy Hilliard from Michigan's Public Health Institute Center for Culturally Responsive Engagement, Velma McBride Murray from Vanderbilt University, and Anaya Patterson from The Warehouse. I would also like to acknowledge and thank my colleagues on the staff team who have been instrumental in the development and execution of this meeting. A special thank you to Julie Tarrant and Stephen Chagrua. Thank you for joining us today. And I will now like to turn to the National Academy of Medicine's Executive Director, Dr. Michael McGinnis to offer additional welcome remarks on behalf of the NAM. Michael, I'll turn to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ivory. Uh, it really is my pleasure and privilege and I underscore privilege uh, to uh, welcome each of you to this conversation and to thank you uh, for joining us and to in advance for lending your wisdom uh, to our work together. I also want to give thanks, uh, of course, to um, the speakers who, are, who have joined us to, today and who you'll hear from in a little bit, as well as to uh, the steering committee that has already been mentioned by Ivory, uh, to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, and its strong commitment uh, to uh, leading the nation into a different and transformed perspective about the role of health equity uh, and uh, our ability to achieve health equity uh, throughout the nation. And finally, uh, underscore the thanks uh, to Ivory and to Julie and to Stephen for their day-to-day -day, uh, leadership in our work here in the National Academies. I can um, explain our gratitude very simply. Um, I'm just going to read the mission of the National Academy of Medicine, which is to improve health for all by advancing science, accelerating health equity, and providing independent, authoritative, and trusted advice nationally and globally. We simply cannot achieve our mission without the guidance of you and your colleagues and our other colleagues around the nation uh, uh, aimed uh, at this fundamentally vital and important charge for all of us. As we've seen so prominently over the last year, our most critical uh, and vital challenge as a nation in the health arena is COVID at the moment, yes, but ultimately and over the medium to longer term and especially prominently manifest by the victims uh, who have been disproportionately afflicted over the last year, health inequities represent our most intractable but formidable and uh, dedicated challenge uh, in the health arena. Our role uh, as the National Academy of Medicine is first and foremost oriented to the science. We are to steward the science about what causes health inequities, what are its consequences, what are its solutions, Ultimately, we work from that base 
the base that uh, we partnered with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and all of you to grow in the coming period uh, to effect change. I've re-mentioned at the outset uh, that there were essentially four components of our program, uh, lead, translate, engage, and sustain. Those are our aims. The lead portion is fundamentally about learning. And that is at, at least from the starting point. We need to marshal the science base as thoroughly and effectively as we can, again, with your help, in order to provide the kind of tools and guidance uh, that can make it easier for all of us throughout the nation and beyond uh, to address the consequences of inequities. The second portion is to translate that science base. You know, sometimes uh, we scientists uh, are accused of uh, uh, speaking in different languages that are not translatable uh, to, uh, to the uh, services uh, and the applications uh, that are required. But translation is a centerpiece uh, and translation uh, in a fashion that is as useful as possible to people on the front line who are working to make the change, all of you and your colleagues, is critical. Also committed, uh, a, a committed portion of our mission is engaging. Engaging stakeholders so that we lock arms and working together for progress. Uh, and you are helping us by virtue of your presence here but you're also helping us uh, by virtue of your identification with and for us, the broader stakeholder community uh, that's necessary uh, to marshal progress. And finally, to sustain. We will only be able to sustain and grow the impact of science uh, on uh, to find solutions uh, with your counsel and with your, uh, 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 with your guidance. One of the fragilities of science in the past in some ways has been the fact that it hasn't engaged those who are most important to its application. Uh, and we're trying by virtue of meetings such as this uh, to ensure uh, that we're working with the benefit of a much fuller perspective uh, and um, a perspective that is informed by all who are affected. Uh, so again, in order to sustain the work uh, that uh, Ivory and the steering committee and others are leading, uh, it's extremely important that we have your best counsel. So again, I'd like to thank each of the speakers uh, for contributions to the conversation. Uh, most importantly, for your contributions in society to helping move the field forward and to each of your participants. Uh, I'm very pleased on behalf of the leadership of the Academy to thank you for your active interest and challenge you to consider the ways in which your work intersects with science, policy, and community engagement. Thank you, and thank you, Ivory. Thank you, Michael, for those wonderful welcoming remarks. Uh, before we move into our formal program, I want to talk a little bit more about how we are planning to facilitate a bit more of an interactive meeting. We'll be using Poll Everywhere throughout our meetings today, tomorrow, and on Thursday. Poll Everywhere is a polling tool in which we'll ask questions and invite you to provide your responses. Answers will be displayed in real time on your screen. To participate in the polls, you will need to either use your cell phone or a computer to submit responses. To participate by computer, please open the web page that you see on your screen. To participate by phone, simply text NAMCOHP752 to the number 2233. You'll only have to text uh, the NAMCOHP752 one time and not for every question. To practice this for this first time, we'll open our first poll that asks, what makes you proud of your community? We'll give about 30 seconds to a minute for folks to start responding to that to get a feel for the poll everywhere. <laughs> 
Thank you. I see that we've got responses coming in. So you should be able to see them up on the screen if you're joining us. Resiliency, perseverance, dedication to education, diversity are a few of the responses that have been coming in. So we'll give another 15 seconds and then we'll move into our first panel. Great. Thank you for completing our first poll. We'll have another one at the conclusion of our meeting today. And as I said, throughout the course of the next day and on Thursday, we'll continue to engage you and pull everywhere responses. I'll, leave, I'll ask that Julie leave this up on the screen as I transition now into the remainder of the meeting. Please note that I will be reading an abbreviated version of our speakers' bios. Their full bio can be found in the digital briefing materials that were sent in advance of the meeting. Next slide, please. I'd like to introduce Melody Phillips, who is the Director of Operations for The Warehouse. The Warehouse is a state-of-the-art teen center for teens by teens in Northeast Wilmington. The Warehouse is guided by five pillars, recreation, education, arts, career, and health. These guiding principles are a key component of the Warehouse's ideology to revolutionize teen engagement. Melody is also the co-founder and board chairwoman of I Am My Sister's Keeper, an organization she co-founded with Charlotte Miller Lacey. I Am My Sister's Keeper, affectionately known to many as MSK, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the development of girls and women. Melody continues to build community partnerships with organizations that are providing meaningful opportunities to young people in order to help them thrive and grow. She lives by the model, you are not simply a product of your environment, change your environment from within. Melody, I'll turn to you to open us with your personal story. Thank you so much, Ivory. It is such a pleasure um, to be here and to share my personal story. So I'll actually kind of start with um, that last sentence, which is, um, you are simply not a product of your environment. So my story is one of um, perseverance, uh, resilience, like some of the um, people put inside of the first question that you asked. And um, I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, the warehouse is also in Wilmington, Delaware. And um, I grew up being raised by my grandmother. And my mother, um, unfortunately, the crack um, epidemic um, took a hold of my mother and she um, was addicted um, while I was growing up. So my grandmother received custody of myself and my younger brother, who's two years younger than me, um, when I was six and he was four years old. Um, and then I have another brother who came along several years after that. Um, when I was 13, he, my youngest brother, was born. Um, and unfortunately for him, he was born addicted. Um, but to go back a little bit, um, the reason I say my story is one of perseverance and one of resilience is because I was raised by a single grandmother. And like a lot of the women who live in Riverside, where we are working towards revolutionizing teen engagement, as well as um, being for the community, with the community, um, I was raised by a single parent household. In Riverside, 87% of the um, households are single women led. And um, although I did not grow up in Riverside, my grandmother and I, um, and she raised us in another part of Wilmington, Delaware called South Bridge. And it is a very um, you know, poor area. Initially, it was um, built for black veterans coming back from um, Vietnam War. Um, but then when white flight happened and um, families were unable to get mortgages, um, a lot of disparity and um, happened within the community. Um, and, and unfortunately, again, you have just, it's very low income. So I was raised over there. Um, and one of the things that relates to health equity that really kind of shifted some of the areas in my life was um, we did have a local medical center. And um, actually it was one of my first jobs as a teenager um, as well. And while we had that local medical center, um, as many of you may know on this call, it was really 
um, focused on people who were receiving um, Medicaid or Medicare. So sometimes when you, you, while we had access to a healthcare system, um, it may not have been at the equity level or equitable level that some of my um, non-minority counterparts would have received living in other areas of um, Delaware um, or across the nation. And um, the other part of my story is that because my grandmother raised me, my mother ended up going to prison for 15 years. Um, and so during that time, I had to go through um, a lot of mental health therapy. And unfortunately, I fell first grade because that is the year that my grandmother gained custody of myself and my younger brother. And it just really took a toll on my ability to complete any schoolwork. So I was um, a very angry young lady growing up. And it was not until I reached uh, sixth grade when I had a mentor who impacted my life. And she was my sixth grade teacher. Her name is Dr. Terry Joyner. And she, um, I used to come into the classroom very upset and very angry just because I didn't understand why I had this plight in life and why nobody seemed to care. And she cut my face one day and she said to me, you are not simply a young black girl from the hood. You are a young African-American girl growing up in a neighborhood that you have the ability to change and impact um, in the future. And so I want you to think about that. And so instead of being angry about your circumstances, I really want you to consider being positive about what you have already and the ability that you have to make changes as you move through your own future. Of course, 12 years old, I'm like, okay, that sounds great. Um, don't really want to hear this. You don't understand. You're a teacher. Your mom's not on drugs. Um, your mom is not in prison and everything. So I just didn't think she understood. And then Dr. Joyner chose to mentor me. And through that, she would come and take me to plays. There's an area in Delaware called Hokesson that growing up I never knew existed, even though it's probably only about 15 minutes from South Bridge where I grew up. And she lived in Hokesson, which is um, predominantly white neighborhood, very affluent area. And the first time I visited, I was amazed because they had grocery stores that I had never heard of. They had medical centers and doctors and, that I had never heard of. Um, and they had different museums and things that, again, I had never heard of because I didn't even know it existed. Um, and so as a young, you know, a young girl um, growing up like that, it was so impactful that I had a teacher who thought it was her plight to make sure that I could see something different than was what was just in my surroundings. And it is the reason why I believe in that, not simply being a product of your environment. Because as I grew and I had an opportunity to experience um, being mentored by her going through life, it also allowed me to then begin to mentor younger girls who were coming after me and show them that they don't have to simply be a product of their environment or the circumstances that they grew up in, but that it is our responsibility and we should take full ownership of giving back to the community that helped mold you and make you into who you are today. And so while I may not have had the best um, um, services that some of my other non-minority counterparts may have experienced and been privileged to. I had a mentor who believed in me and a grandmother who would simply not give up on her grandchildren. And so it is my great honor and privilege every day to be able to impart the wisdom from those two women and a lot of other women and men in my life um, who have helped me along this walk. And so then I can give that back to the teens I have the privilege of working with at the warehouse. Um, a lot of times when I share my story, people are like profound, especially teens, because they'll say, wait, Miss Melody, you grew up in South Bridge? And I'll say yes. And they'll say to me, oh, wait a minute, like you were poor? And I'll say yes. I, I, you know, I got my clothes from the Goodwill and everything. 
And they're amazed to know that I'm the director of operations and that I have a master's degree working on a PhD. And I say to them, um, you can do everything I have done and do it even better. And so it just is simply something that instills, I like to instill grit in them, perseverance, perseverance, excuse me, and resilience, because those are the things that have allowed me to thrive and continue to grow not only professionally, but personally. And so it is um, an experience to know that everything I do is um, for something bigger than myself. And I have two daughters, one's 19 and one is five years old. And for them to be able to see the things I do on the behalf of our community is impactful. Um, my oldest daughter has had the opportunity to see me at each graduation from my associates to my bachelor's to my master's. And some of them, she was only three and four years old. And so I am just always excited to share my story and to know that my story may help another young black girl from the hood. And so I thank you for this opportunity to share that. Thank you, Melody, for sharing your story and for this powerful understanding and contextualization of our journey towards health equity. I'd now like to, to move us into our, our session of the day, Why Do Inequities Persist in Communities? And it's my pleasure to introduce these three panelists. Mr. Latruo Diaz is the Vice President for Housing and Financial Empowerment at Unidos US. He oversees the development and implementation of Unidos US's community development programs, provides technical assistance coordination to Unidos US affiliates in developing and financing real estate projects and developing homeownership programs. And he develops single family real estate development and alternative financial services programs nationally. Mr. Diaz earned a master's in urban planning at the University of California at Los Angeles and his bachelor's in international relations at California State University at Northridge. Dr. Stephanie Russo Carroll is the Associate Director and Manager for Tribal Health Programs and the Native Nations Institute at the University of Arizona. Her research explores the links between Indigenous governance, data, the environment, and community wellness. Her interdisciplinary lab group, the Collaboratory for Indigenous Data Governance Research, develops research, policy, and practice innovations for Indigenous data sovereignty. The lab's research, teaching, and engagement seek to transform institutional governance and ethics for Indigenous control of Indigenous data, particularly within open science, open data, and big data contexts. Stephanie is, received her bachelor's from Cornell University and her MPH and DRPH from the Mel and Enid Zuckerman College of Public Health at the University of Arizona. And we have Mr. Rufus Williams, who is the former president and CEO of BBF Family Services, also known as the Better Boys Foundation. He is an accomplished results-oriented financial strategist and entrepreneur with a long-standing commitment to civic engagement and education. Formerly, he served as the president of the Board of Education for the City of Chicago, the nation's third largest school system, and has been a consistent leader on boards of several of the city's top schools and civic organizations. He is a life trustee of Francis W. Parker School, served as the vice chairman and treasurer of Providence St. Mel School, and was the president of the local school council of Whitney M. Young Magnet School. Thank you each for joining us. And Mr. Diaz, I will turn to you. Thank you, Ivory. I appreciate that. Let me just pull up my, uh, my presentation here. Uh, I hope everyone can see the screen. Thank you. Uh, again, thank, I want to thank um, the National Academy of Medicine for the opportunity to address what is uh, a really uh, 
complicated issue, and that is the recalcitrance of inequality, uh, particularly in, in communities of color. Um, these are issues that a civil rights organization like Unidos US contemplates and works on every day. Um, the vision of our organization is to support, um, support the development of a strong America where economic, political, and social uh, development uh, advancement is a reality for all Latinos, where all Hispanics thrive and our community contributions are recognized. And I will say a word about kind of how we do that at the end of the presentation as time permits. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to quickly take you through um, a demographic uh, picture um, of Latinos in this country, then some historical and migration markers to provide uh, a few indicators of why the population here and is growing. And the end uh, with some underlying causes that recalcitrant inequality continues to be a uh, continuing theme within Latino population and other communities as well. Um, the Hispanic population is diverse. Um, young, it is young and it's struggling to, uh, as a population to improve its wealth and income uh, for, for their families and as with many other communities of color. A few critical characteristics to point out is we are a population that's growing at currently at 60 million. Eight out of 10 are US citizens, although voter participation rates are lower than, um, than other communities. More, more than not, uh, more are not recent immigrants. It is a young population with a common, uh, the most common age being 11 years old. It is diverse racially with 24% considered to be Afro-Latinos and common community responds to the questions of race in a variety of ways. And lastly, the workforce participation rates have always been historically high. And as, it, as you can see, median incomes and median net worth lag way behind the white community. So how and why is the population here and what has driven its growth. I'm gonna take a few historical migration points just to kind of illustrate the, tr the kind of the path. I'll start first, Hispanics have been in the in, in Western US for a very long time. Uh, the Treaty with, of uh, Guadalupe Hidalgo ended the Mexican-American War in 1848. Mexicans had been living in the West and Southwestern territories for a long time before the war ended. Uh, also in 1848, you saw the first, the first discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill, which is in Northern California. And uh, this plus the migration west generally just added fuel to the number of settlers migrating west. The treaty brought into the Americas, American Southwest, the current states of Arizona, California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, Texas, and Wyoming. The Mexican citizens living in the acquired territory were offered a choice between American citizenship to be granted at some future time by Congress or repatriation to Mexico. Over 90% of the Mexican Americans then chose to remain in the ter these territories awaiting formal citizenship. But under the treaty's guarantees that maintained and protected their free enjoyment of liberty and property and secured their free exercise of religious freedoms. The implementation of the treaty, uh, unfortunately, did not live up to its spirits as, as lands were expropriated by the new settlers and discriminations commenced in the areas that many times even ended up in lynchings. A second item I'll point to is the Spanish-American War that ended in 1898. At that time, the Spanish government relinquished sovereignty over Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Philippines. Since that time, Puerto Rico has been a territory of the U.S. and its habit and its habits re received citizenship in 1917. And ever since the, and then and continually over the years, immigration back and forth to the U.S. has been a, a constant um, factor in the in the two countries relation two areas relationship. Additionally, Cuban immigration prior to the 1959 revolution that brought Fidel Castro to power. <clears throat> 
was consistent for both political and economic reasons. But after 1959, over 75% of the current Cuban immigrants emigrated to the US. There was a second impetus uh, to Mexican immigration when labor programs that, that the US and Mexican government jointly created beginning in the 1950s to encourage Mexicans to come to the US as contract workers, primarily uh, in agriculture, but in under industry, under other industries as well. And then more recently, the Central, Central American migration has escalated as families try to escape poverty, violence, and food insecurity in their, in their countries of origin. This quick kind of synopsis or snapshot of, of, of kind of historical migrating, migration patterns is not comprehensive and I, it wasn't intended to be, but it just provide, try to provide a sense of how population, are, the Latino population developed in this country and really is kind of a, just a stage setter for uh, really to shift to the question at hand, which is why recalcitrant inequality consist, continues to persist. Um, at this point, I believe the Hispanic experience with inequality has similarities with other communities of color. This is not to say that their experience were the same, they were not, but there is one overriding similarity, I believe. Governmental policy choices help create and sustain an unstable economic foundations for communities of color. There are many examples to choose from, but I picked a few that most of us know, uh, know most of know of to just illustrate the effect. The social security system in this country was enacted during the during uh, as a result to the of the depression in the 1930s and 40s, and it created a really a, a nationwide system of income support. Yet the legislation excluded from coverage about half the workers in the American, co economy, American economy. Among the excluded groups were agriculture and domestic workers, a large percentage of which were African-American and Latino. A second example you can point to is the Fair Labor Standards Act, which created the 44-hour work week. But, uh, also, but it also excluded the very same agriculture and domestic workers. These exclusions are crucial. They were crucial at the time to preserve a way of life that hinged on exploiting cheap labor in, in, in primarily agriculture and was particularly um, impactful on the African-American population. A third example I'll point to is uh, policies that created the interstate highway system. Uh, government subsidized mortgage, like uh, many know of the uh, federal FHA program, or, uh, Federal Home, Federal Home Association, Federal Home Association, and the mortgage interest deduction, which many homeowners take advantage of, all of which fueled a massive increase in suburban home ownership for white families, but excluded communities of color. Um, it also catalyzed an exodus of the middle income families from the inner cities uh, to the suburbs, spurring an economic decline from the 60s until more recently. And as and it is true that in cities, many families of color uh, choose to live. The FHA mortgage insurance lending requirements is another example. The program ultimately institutionalized racism and segregation within the housing industry. FHA lending explicitly practiced a policy of redlining when determining which neighborhoods to approve mortgages in redlining and the practice of denying or eliminating, finan limiting financial services to certain neighborhoods based on racial or ethnic composition without regards to the residents' qualifications or creditworthiness. It is true that since these initial, these, these initial enacted laws and policies, there has been changes to ameliorate many of the blatantly racist elements, but it does not change the fact that the harm um, of the, that the harm of not being able to participate in the benefits they, full, they provided full, uh, they, that they, these programs offered weakened the economic foundations for, for people, uh, for communities of color. My message here is the cumulative result of many exclusionary policy decisions in, in, in our country, only some of which were explicitly discriminatory based on race or ethnicity, 
have shaped a fundamentally unequal society. And on, at the onset of the pandemic, communities of color were simultaneously more susceptible to the coronavirus and the resulting economic dislocations, but had far less comprehensive safety net to fall back on. Now that um, that now that uh, that was an extremely fast description of a very complicated set of social issues and, and economic issues, and I know much was missed. The simple point I'm making here is that policies can make inequality worse, um, but it is also one that can easily get lost in the policy debates on a whole host of issues like public schools, economic development, labor rights, healthcare, access to credit, to name a few. This is also this is also an area where we work in, and as a lead in how Unidos US approaches the work to work on issues related to inequality. Um, I, I wanted to start by stating time-wise, I think we're probably okay, but I'll just state a couple approaches that we take. Um, we conduct research in economic, political, and social barriers Latino, um, Latinos are facing, collaborate with others to formulate policy recommendations to address these barriers, and then conduct advocacy to get policy developed or changed. Um, and if you want to see some samples of that, you can go to our website, www.unidosus.org. We also are a, we're a membership organization. We have affiliated organizations we work, to work through. And as we collaborate on issues, whether it's um, health inequities, um, ho housing related inequities, um, access to jobs, those types of things, we take general research and uh, information about that and work with our local agencies who are working closely with families experiencing all uh, various forms of access to, to, to services and or um, opportunities to help resolve them. And so it's kind of a two-pronged area. We, we do the research and advocacy and conduct it in a national platform. And we also work with our affiliate partners locally to really uplift uh, and either information and or um, program opportunities that, that are created that have, that will make families' lives a little better. Um, I pointed, there's two elements there on the screen, I'll kind of end with this, is that, you know, for example, one of the things when child, this child tax credit was um, developed, we. Unidos US was very vocal and did a lot of research and advocacy to get it passed. And the primary reason is too, well, first of all, I think it was a needed element in, in support system that the nation, need, nation has, but also we wanted to make sure that Latinos fully participate in the program to the degree possible. Uh, we're known more for immigration reform and the deferred DACA program, a deferred action for childhood arrivals program. Uh, again, similarly, not only um, uh, worked with partners and others to kind of push that area because we believe immigration reform is really a necessary element for the country to move forward um, and also develop programs around that to encourage uh, participation. And then I put down there a couple of other things that we do. We have a large, one of the largest national housing counseling organiz uh, networks out there that targets Latino communities. And it's out there every day with through local agencies uh, promoting both home ownership when possible, but also assistance in terms of resolving housing issues when needed to, to do to maintain a home, which um, is a very critical part in the culture of health, both from an education standpoint and from a health standpoint. And then we also have network of Promotores de Salud, which is a, a network of agencies that offer um, information and health service access to a variety of communities across, uh, across the nation. Again, these are both examples where a national platform or a national programs are working with local agencies to better the lives uh, and upward mobility of families. With that, Ivory, I'll, I'll end. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I will turn to you, Dr. Carroll. 
Hello, everybody. While I'm working to get my slide share up and going, um, let's see. I'll just begin by saying thank you to Ivory and every one of the organizers and hosts for this important discussion. Um, and also let you know uh, that I will, I'll put my video on very briefly here, but I'm going to be um, turning, turning off my video uh, as I have in, unstable internet here and it's gone a little wonky with some of my presentations over the last couple of days. Excellent. Thank you so much. So Sidak Atna Kastan, Sidak Stephanie Carroll, Tishu Sa, Slandak Nelchina. Hello, I'm Stephanie Carroll. I'm Atna, a citizen of the native village of Kulika along the Op Copper River in Alaska, and I'm of Sicilian descent. I acknowledge the Tanakam Nation and the Pascuyaki tribe on whose unceded lands I sit today in Tucson, Arizona. Today, I'll be introducing concepts around eclipsing equity, indigenous people's sovereignty, data, and research. Um, and I'll provide an overview of indigenous data sovereignty, which I was asked to speak to today, um, which actively seeks to engage changes in research and data practices. In our current pandemic, with the aggregated threats of multiple epidemics, such as COVID and non-communicable diseases, combined with racism, colonialism, climate changes, Indigenous data sovereignty sits as a counterpoint to the deeply embedded ways in which we conceptualize healthy and promote healthy communities. While focused on the rights of indigenous peoples, the concepts motivate connection in anti-colonial spaces to address health, socioeconomic and political inequities as symptoms of structural and foundational values and policies. I'm going to begin with seven grounding truths about indigenous peoples and data that will frame this discussion. First, sovereignty matters. Second, data are relations. Thus, we have data-related responsibilities. Third, data are critical to the exercise of tribal sovereignty. Fourth, only indigenous peoples and nations can exercise indigenous data sovereignty. Fifth, enacting indigenous data sovereignty includes both data for governance and governance of data. Sixth, Tribally driven data work requires relationships with other data actors and experts for both stewardship and expertise. And finally, assertions of indigenous data sovereignty spur innovation and design in data and research policy and practice as foundational to healthy thriving communities. Indigenous peoples have always been data creators, data users, data stewards. Data were and are embedded in indigenous instructional practices and cultural principles. For, for example, many indigenous knowledge systems were based on generations of data gathered through observation and experience that then informed indigenous practices, protocols, and ways of interacting with other people and with the natural world. The translation of knowledge into data was similarly evident. Indigenous data were recorded in oral histories, stories, winter counts, calendar sticks, totem poles, some of which you see here, and other instruments that stored information for the benefit of the entire community. Protocols exist for the sharing and use of such knowledge. The ongoing processes of colonization of indigenous communities and globalization of Western ideas, values, and lifestyles have resulted in epistemicide, the suppression and co-optation of indigenous, indigenous knowledges and data systems. Through federal policies of assimilation, forced removal, relocation, the adoption or the promotion of federal definitions of who indigenous peoples are and who belongs based on blood quantum, residential schooling and other cultural ruptures sought to erase indigenous people and knowledges. These acts forced many tribes to rely on external sources of information about their community's economic, environmental and health status and challenged indigenous people to recover, develop and sustain their knowledges today. The indigenous, the revitalization of indigenous knowledges and the application of indigenous design to data and research is central to indigenous people's capacity to realize their human rights and fulfill those responsibilities to themselves as peoples and to the natural world. For indigenous peoples, shifting discussions from equity to sovereignty reorients, reorientates conceptions of well being and community health from deficit and disparity to rights and responsibilities. Indigenous peoples' data are data, information, and knowledge in any format that impact indigenous peoples as collectives and as in, at the individual level. 
Indigenous people's data comprise information and knowledge about the environment, land, skies, resources, and non-humans which which we have relations. Information about in Indigenous individuals such as administrative data, health data, and more, and information and knowledge about Indigenous peoples as collectives, including traditional and cultural information, oral histories, clan knowledge, stories, and belongings. Indigenous data sovereignty is the right of Indigenous peoples to govern their data from collection and storage to use and reuse. It is grounded in inherent sovereignty and thus only Indigenous peoples and nations as rights holders can exercise Indigenous data sovereignty. Indigenous data sovereignty is a responsibility grounded in the ways, traditions, and roles that communities have for the care of their knowledge. The UN Declaration the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, or UNDRIP, reaffirms Indigenous peoples' rights to self-determination as political entities and honors the principle of Indigenous control over Indigenous data. UNDRIP reflects a broad approach to Indigenous data that is not restricted by mainstream conceptions of knowledge and intellectual property. Finally, knowledge belongs to the collective and is fundamental to who we are as Indigenous peoples. Indigenous data sovereignty relocates authority over data back to Indigenous peoples, shifting the paradigm from equity to sovereignty. We have an existing data paradigm for Indigenous peoples. At the top is where we're going. Indigenous peoples, both academic, community members, youth, elders, leading and creating data knowledge and information for use in Indigenous communities, as well as externally on our own terms. At the very bottom, we have a state of complete data dependency where the vast majority of data needed for indigenous decision-making are not available. Exercising sovereignty in relation to data can occur at each one of these stages. For instance, in the COVID era, indigenous nations need access to data created by them for other institutions, such as health departments, such as basic COVID infection and mortality data. Each of these scenarios require building and maintaining partnerships between tribal and other tribal entities, tribal and non-tribal entities, as well as empowering youth and cultural advisors. For instance, in the bias for them category, we can consider sensitive cultural information and geographic locations that might be needed to might need to be revealed or shared for court cases and other environmental processes. How do we begin to strengthen relationships? trust and data infrastructures to protect the use of such information. Data are critical to the exercise of tribal sovereignty. Indigenous peoples require data for governance so, and self-determined decision-making. And at the same time, the current era of information proliferation and use demands that indigenous nations harness tribal values, principles, and mechanisms. So indigenous ways of knowing and doing and apply them to the management and control of their nation's data. Tribally driven work requires relationships with other data actors and experts, both for expertise in data governance and as well as data for governance and to accelerate external data stewards managing indigenous governed data by indigenous standards. Both domestically and internationally, communities of practice and advocacy exist through indigenous data sovereignty focused networks in the US, Canada, Australia, and Aotearoa, New Zealand as well as indigenous data sovereignty activities in many other areas across the globe. The Global Indigenous Data Alliance, or GITA, is an international network of networks that promotes indigenous control of indigenous data, reinforcing the rights to engage in decision-making in accordance with indigenous values and collective interests. Released by GITA, the care principles for indigenous data governance, collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, ethics, and their sub-principles, set forth critical considerations for non-tribal data actors, creators, stewards, and users, and are designed to guide the inclusion of indigenous peoples and data governance across contemporary data ecosystems. The care principles importantly bring a people and purpose orientation to data governments, governance, which complements the data-centric nature of other principles, such as the FAIR principles, which focus on findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data. The care principles shift the focus of data governance from consultation to values-based relationships. The care principles are designed to be complementary to the FAIR principles to promote equitable participation and outcomes from data access, use, reuse, and attribution in contemporary data landscape. Implementation of the care principles should be seen as a dimension of open and fair data that ensures the use of data is purposeful, 
and enhances the well being of Indigenous peoples. Indigenous data, therefore, should be both fair and care. Currently, the vast majority of Indigenous data are neither fair nor care. In the critical era of open data, big data, and open science, Indigenous collections and data can be hard to find. They can be buried in larger collections, data sets, or repositories. Indigenous data are often mislabeled, not properly attributed, and not searchable. Thus, Indigenous collections and data are not fair and do, and do not perpetuate Indigenous provenance, protocols, or purposes. We are concerned about implementing fair and care on already existing data within collections, repositories, and data sets, as well as instituting policies and practices to operationalize fair and care in the ongoing creation of new data. The, the care principles find roots and expression across law, policy, ethics, and infrastructure. For example, our current human subjects regulations do not provide space for collective rights and interests, but at the same time, the UNDRIP affirms many of the care principles. Within policy at federal agencies, universities, and other institutions, we need to make space for and underscore Indigenous rights and responsibilities as critical components of serving and practicing within Indigenous communities and within uh, partnerships with Indigenous peoples. Change can also happen through shifts in ethical frameworks that not only inform training, but also tools such as the uses of notices by researchers, repositories, and collections that clearly state openness to collaborate around stewardship of Indigenous data and to recognize Indigenous sovereignty and the, the responsibility to hold those relationships at the highest level. Finally, there is a need to alter digital their infrastructures by creating new standards and practices. Currently used mechanisms that can reflect and enact the care principles include tribal data governance tools such as tribal codes, guidelines, and research review processes, data sharing, um, data sharing memorandums of understanding, and other agreements between Indigenous peoples and other institutions, uh, or institutional policies and procedures, and labels and notices, which are mechanisms for Indigenous communities to engage with cultural and research institutions to manage their rights over property and knowledge. But more tools are needed, as well as methods to assess and evaluate how these other institutions are enacting the care principles. Importantly, care needs to be applied across data life cycles through laws, institutional policies, and ethical change. We need durable changes to data infrastructure that per persist throughout the data life cycle from funding to creation, to storage, to use and reuse. We all have a role in changing the systems in which we live and work, and we must interrogate, interrogate underlying values and the syndemic that plagues our communities. Finally, I just wanna end by how we work to empower indigenous data sovereignty and data governance through recognizing and promoting sovereignty, dialoguing with multiple ways of knowing, leading with indigenous ingenuity and core values, conducting science and service to community and community-driven research, and engage and promote indigenous scholarship and leadership. Finally, use and support existing tribal and ind indigenous data governance protocols and procedures and fund these changes that are needed within infrastructure, learning, and so much more. And at, at the very end, we must be humble and be good relatives. Thank you, Ivory. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. And now I'll turn to you, Mr. Williams. A new class of people has taken root in America's cities, a lost society dwelling in enclaves of despair and chaos that infect and threaten the communities at large. Go to the next slide, please. The existence of an underclass in itself is not new in this country. What appears to be different today is the seemingly permanent entrapment of significant numbers of Americans, especially urban blacks, in a world apart at the bottom of society. For the first time, much of the rest of America seems to be accepting a permanent underclass as a fact of life. This is quoted from a series done by the Chicago Tribune in 1985 that they call the American Millstone. Here they describe a people who constitute a segment of an underclass that is mostly black and poor and hopelessly trapped in urban centers of Chicago and other large cities of the nation. Three very important words, underclass, permanent, and hopeless. 
I am excited about this conference and excited about this topic. This is the perfect angle for the National Academy of Medicine, Culture of Health to continue this discussion. Thank you to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for supporting this work. And thank you, Ivory Clark, for giving me the opportunity to address this from ground zero. Next slide, please. The American Millstone, uh, next slide, please. The American Millstone, which I referred to earlier, no, uh, was written about experiences in a West Side community of Chicago known as North Lawndale. The organization that I have led for the last five years is in North Lawndale. Having been home to more than 120,000 residents in the 1960s, North Lawndale is now home to approximately 34,000 residents, 87% of whom are black, 9% Latinx, and 3% white. 32% of the residents are under 20 years old, 4% are 75 or older, 25% have less than a high school diploma, 31% have a high school diploma or equivalent, and only 8% have a, have a bachelor's degree. Median income in this community is $27,000. 48% of the people make less than $25,000 annually. 26% make between $25,000 and $50,000. 7% make more than $100,000. 48% of the people are not in the labor force. These are 2018 pre-COVID numbers. I grew up in North Lawndale and a similar adjacent community. For the last 30 years, I have lived on the North side in the Lincoln Park community, which is 79% white and 5% black. 84% of Lincoln Park's residents have at least a bachelor's degree. Median income is $109,000. So I experienced the dark, the stark differences between these communities every single day. Life expectancy in North Lawndale is 63 years. For the entire city, it is nearly 78 years. These are the disparities. The question we are attempting to address is why do they persist? Next slide, please. I posit several thoughts I believe perpetuate health inequality in communities from my deep and varied experiences. Next slide, please. First, there is a distrust of healthcare systems. We have a clear and broad knowledge of slavery and the dehumanization of our ancestors by many of the groups who have always run these systems and these people are generally not trusted. There is a sordid history of eugenics programs which were practiced to breed out blacks in Virginia, North Carolina, with Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood, as well as other programs. Additionally, studies like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment occurring as recently as 1972, where black men were only observed but not treated as they suffered through the full stages of untreated syphilis while being told they were receiving free health care from the US government breeds this distrust. In fact, in this current epidemic, a recent study by the NAACP and the COVID Collaborative reported that only 14% of black participants trust that the COVID-19 vaccine is safe. Two, disinvestment in the community. In 1966, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. moved to North Lawndale to protest housing policies in the North. When he was assassinated in April, 1968, civil unrest impacted communities like North Lawndale tremendously. More than 50 years later, vacant lots that appeared in April, 1968 are still vacant lots today. There has not only been no reinvestment, but in fact, there has been disinvestment in these communities. North Lawndale at the time was the world headquarters of Sears Roebuck and Company, Ryerson Steel, Magicus Carpets, and a host of other businesses. By 1980, those businesses and the jobs that accompanied them had left the West Side. No reinvestment has occurred in any measurable way. Thus, actual disinvestment has occurred. Three, the lack of resources and the lack of health insurance precludes people from seeking medical care, especially preventative care. Health insurance often comes with full-time employment. Such employment has, been, has long been difficult in these communities and is even more difficult today. The Affordable Care Act helped significantly 
but many didn't obtain this coverage until they needed it, which is often late in the cycle of care. Too often the medical care given was at a different and much lower standard than in more affluent communities. Inferior educational outcomes. Grandparents, parents, and students have struggled in our schools. Unfortunately and consistently, students are not learning enough. The achievement gap is real, persistent, and generational. Low educational attainment and inferior educational outcomes persist generationally. As a result, it is difficult for those most impacted to understand these deficiencies and how to overcome them. Five, poverty. As you can see from, as you can see from many of the previously noted areas, poverty is pervasive. Poverty is grinding. People don't have money and they are forced to make difficult decisions about priorities, like deciding between paying rent, paying school fees, getting gas for the car, buying food, having heat and water, or paying healthcare premiums. The poverty is so extreme that families become accustomed to being evicted from their homes. Many, in fact, are homeless. They do not have food to eat. They couch surf with friends and family as much as possible. Poverty is real and it is difficult and it pushes people to make decisions about survival that seem abnormal to many in our general society. Six, all of the previous barriers are connected at the root by one prevailing issue, racism. Being black in America is a pre-existing condition. Racism in America is structural and is systemic. Thurgood Marshall pointed out that the law enslaved black people, the law freed black people, the law segregated black people, and the law is now allowed for our integration. In her most recent book titled Cast, where she eloquently describes how culture works in America, Isabel Wilkerson makes the case that racism is actually a function of a system in America that has forever indoctrinated blacks as inferior and has perpetuated a caste system ensuring that this will always be the case. She states, any action or institution that mocks, harms, assumes, or attaches inferiority or stereotype on the basis of the social construct of race can be considered racism. Any action or structure that limits, that seeks to limit, hold back, or put someone in a defined ranking, that seeks to keep someone in their place by elevating or denigrating that person on the basis of their perceived category can be seen as casteism. In The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, he describes how laws and policy decisions at the federal, state, and local levels promoted discriminatory patterns that persist to this day. In Stamp from the Beginning, Ibram Kendi chronicles the entire story of anti-Black racist ideas and their staggering power over the course of American history, which helps us to understand why the inequities that we see and experience are so persistent. The engagement of this racist system is not scientific but has been developed and maintained by people. These pervasive racist systems and structures that minimize black lives and do not allow black people to develop wealth, live healthy lives and participate in society without the stress of being black is the greatest barrier to inequity in communities. That weight is heavy in North Lawndale and other marginalized communities throughout the United States. Central to the existence of human life is water and air. I will remind us of all the issues of the water crisis in Flint, Michigan and its impact on the predominantly black community there. A similar situation occurred in East Chicago, Indiana. We're, we wear masks because COVID-19 transmits through the air. So it is impossible to have this discussion in 2020 without addressing the impact of this current pandemic. At the end of last week, the CDC quietly adjusted its reporting to reflect that after adjusting for age, which is a standard means of measuring disease impact, Black and Latinos are dying at rates three times higher than whites, as opposed to the previously reported two and one times respectively. Senator Elizabeth Warren stated, 
The fact that the average age among communities of color is much younger than that of non-Hispanic white Americans makes the disproportionate, disproportionate number of deaths among communities of color all the more disturbing. This is significant and forces us to question why this misreporting occurred in the first place. Dr. Leanna Wynn, former Baltimore Health Commissioner stated that there are more, there are underlying factors in society that are causing the disproportionate impact on people of color and we must be committed to working on the social determinants of health. I hope the people will see that it's not the virus that is discriminating, it's our systems. It's important for us to understand why it is that COVID-19 has unveiled and unmasked these underlying disparities. Next slide, please. To finish where I began, the American Millstone gave rationale for people to recognize and accept the lot of this hopeless, permanent underclass of people. I, along with most who live or have lived in North Lawndale, and similar communities around the country summarily reject this notion. But I agree with this statement that they made. In order to lift a millstone, you must first see it. Dr. King told us, history will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period of social transition was not the strident clamor of bad people, but the appalling silence of good people. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality Whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. He who accepts evil without protesting against it is really cooperating with it. And anyone with a scintilla of empathy will recognize how truly heartbreaking this is, particularly in the world's most prosperous country and do something to make things better. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Williams. And thank you again to all of our previous speakers.